Hello people, today I will be analyzing an iconic speech that was delivered by Queen Elizabeth I to the troops at Tilbury on the 19th of August 1588. A lot of context is required here, so let's delve into that first. The Spanish Armada had withdrawn because of the Battle of Gravelines. There was some relief, but there was also disappointment because the Armada had not been destroyed and there was still a threat of invasion. Queen Elizabeth I, who is believed to have often absented herself at times of crisis, took a central role in the campaign here, with her throne and her life at stake. The troops that had gathered at Tilbury were poorly trained and ill-equipped, and they inspired little confidence. The commander, Robert Dudley, all of Leicester, who was the Queen's old suitor, was also ill-considered as a general. He understood the value of propaganda, however, and it is believed that he is the one who orchestrated this address at Tilbury. The visual imagery is just as important as the words here. What Queen Elizabeth I wore for this is she wore a plumed helmet and a steel armour over a white velvet gown. She held a gold and silver baton in her hand as she rode atop a white steed. The plumed helmet, the, the white velvet gown and the steel armour, all of this along with the white steed is to give Queen Elizabeth a mythological iconography. The kind of imagery that she is creating is similar to that of Goddess Athena. She is distinguishing herself in visual manner. By wearing a steel armour, she is also portraying that she is willing to fight with her army. It is also believed that she carried a sword on the side, though there are various discrepancies in her appearance in general. For those who are unable to hear her words, Pre-prepared texts were distributed to the officers to repeat to their men on the following day and for the priest to read from the pulpit. This proves that this was a great piece of propaganda and we'll see how successful it was. She begins by saying, My loving people. By saying my loving people, she is establishing her position. In what role is it that she is delivering this speech? She is delivering it to her loving people. And her people are loving of her. They approve of her. She is signalling that she has the approval of her people. And that they love her. And this is somewhat distinct from several other monarchs who believed in divine authority and did not really care about their popularity or how much their people loved to them. And this is something that is unique about her. She says, We have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. A very, very important dialogue. Let tyrants fear. She is very clearly indicating that there are many people who believe that there might be some sort of treachery on the part of her subjects. But she says that she will not live to distrust her faithful and loving people. She sincerely believes that her people are faithful and loving. And since she is not a tyrant, she does not need to fear any sort of treachery. She says, I have always so behaved myself that under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. She says that her greatest safeguard is in the fact that she has loyal subjects. And that is her goodwill. She says that I have come amongst you, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst of the heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdom and my people, my honor and my blood, even in the dust. When she says that she is not here for recreation and disport, what she is doing is that she is basically clearing off any sort of a belief that since she is a woman, she is only here for recreation and does not have a real role. She clarifies very clearly that she is here to live and die amongst the people, something that is reinforced by her image of riding on a horse in armour and with weapons. She says that she is willing to lay down her life for her god, her kingdom and her people. And she is willing to be dust for that purpose. She says then, I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and the stomach of a king, and a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Palmer or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, 
to which rather than dishonor shall grow by me i myself will take up arms i myself will be your general judge and rewarder of your virtues in the field she begins by acknowledging that she is a weak and feeble woman why does she do that she does that to disarm the crowd that might be hostile towards her there might be a faction of the crowd that believes she is just a woman what can she do she is just weak and feeble but what she does is that she disarms such kind of a faction by acknowledging right in the beginning i know i have the body of a weak and feeble woman there she disarms them and then immediately she goes and says but i have the stomach and the heart of a king and a king of england and immediately she is claiming power she then invokes that she has this belief that it is foul scorn that any prince of europe should dare to invade her realm by doing that she is also turning the enmity against the enemies into something that legitimizes her own power and she says i myself will take up arms and i will be your general judge and rewarder of virtues in the field she then says i already know for your forwardness you have deserved rewards and crowns and we do assure you on the word of a prince that they shall be duly paid in the meantime my lieutenant general shall in my stead than whom never prince commanded a more noble or worthy subject not doubting but by your obedience to my general by your concord in the camp and by your valor in the field we shall shortly have a famous victory over these enemies of my god of my kingdom and of my people by referring to forwardness she is indicating to the fact that a lot of the troops at tilbury were volunteers they were forward and for that reason itself they deserved rewards and that is something that she accepts right in the beginning and then she says that i do assure you that you will be duly paid what she does what she does then is that she passes her own credibility and power to the lieutenant general who was not very popular there were some debates about his credibility as a lieutenant general and there what she is doing is after talking about how she has a legitimate claim to power she is passing that on to the lieutenant general she is passing her own credibility on to the lieutenant general and she says i do not doubt that you will be obedient to my general my general by that she is placing her trust in the general and also in the soldiers to obey the general and then she says that we will have a famous victory over the enemies of my god of my kingdom and of my people now by saying that the enemy is an enemy of god immediately a noble cause is being invoked now the war is no longer about fear of invasion it's no longer about defense of the country itself while that is very important and that has already been talked about she now brings it up to a nobler cause these are enemies of your god and that is why you need to be victorious because otherwise otherwise you would be letting down your god and that is the end of this page what happens in the aftermath we understand that the battle was won by england but it was not because of the english army rather it was because of a protestant wind what happened is that the armada was heading straight into one of the worst storms in living memory at that time it was referred to as the protestant wind later why was it called the protestant wind because queen elizabeth the 1 had changed the religion of england into that of the protestant one from the catholic one and she had done that basically because the catholic church called her illegitimate they had retrospectively called her illegitimate and for that reason the protestants were more accepting of her legitimacy on the uh, throne and that is why she had changed the official religion of england to that of the protestants hence when a storm caused the elimination of the armada the ripping apart of the armada ships on the rocks in that situation what the phrase was used was god breathed and the enemies were scattered and that wind was referred to as the protestant wind we see here the armada portrait a very very important painting in history and something that shows the kind of imagery that was built of queen elizabeth the 1 we see on the left over here the english fire ships that are drifting towards the spanish fleet on the right we see the spanish ships that are driven onto a rocky coast amid stormy seas by that protestant wind 
we see Queen Elizabeth in the middle as if she is the primary causer of all of this. She is the primary mover who has led to the victory of England. We also see how she has her back turned on the storms and where she faces there is sunlight and victory. And hence we see the image of a nation that becomes inviolable under the reign of the Virgin Queen. And with this reign, the Virgin Queen had become the Virgin Gloriana.